Here, today's um, sermon for Sunday is Get Happy, Make It Happen. And so our text is going to be Proverbs 13, 19. Um, this will be the last class uh, or last sermon that we're going to use from the class that uh, Lori Santos has been teaching, The Science of Well-Being. It is the most popular class in the history of Yale. And so you can take that course, and I do recommend doing that. It's by downloading the app Coursera, course with a RA at the end of it, and um, sign up for the science of well-being. It's free. And so at this point, we're at the end of her lectures. Um, the rest of the class, uh, in terms of when I'm looking ahead in the weeks, are basically devoted for her to try to get these students to put into practice some of the strategies that she's suggested that are all going to lift their happiness levels and their well-being levels. Everything she has talked about, I've associated over this uh, course of sermons with the Word of God. Uh, nothing she has suggested is against the Word of God. It's all found in the Word of God. And yes, I do believe that you be a doer of the Word of God. You should genuinely being able to have a sense of happiness and a sense of well-being in the life that you're living. Um, she has taught us that the things that we think will make us happy won't. Uh, she's mentioned money, good job, marriage, perfect body, uh, and, and she's let us she's let us know those things. Even though everyone thinks they'll make that'll make them happy, it actually won't. Okay, but she's also given us some counterintuitive strategies when it comes to money. How do you spend your money? Because that will determine some happiness. If you spend your money on yourself versus someone else, you'll be happier if you spend your money on someone else. If you spend your money on things that you'll have it'll grow old and you'll get used to and you'll lose that sense of happiness from that bright shiny thing you thought would make you happy. Instead, spend your money on experiences, going places, doing things, going to a restaurant, whatever it might be. Experiences will be something you can carry with you into the future. And so um, she talked about jobs. You want to be happy at a job? Use your strengths at your job. We started this off by doing a little survey where you should have been able to see the strengths that you have. And it doesn't mean that your job requires those strengths, but I can bring my strengths into my place of work. If my strength is kindness, I can be kind while that I'm at that workplace. If my strength is my Christianity, spiritual, I can live my Christianity in that workplace, thus giving me a joy in the workplace that I am. Her studies also showed, are you happier working or just doing nothing at home? Once again, believe it or not, you're happier doing something, working. And this is the way God has made us. Uh, your marriage, you want to really enjoy your marriage? Very simply, learn how to appreciate or show gratitude towards your spouse. And so in, in all this, she's asked us to focus on some very simple things that once again, she, she's having each one of these classes with tons of studies showing how these are the things that can increase your level of happiness, okay? And in that, she mentions uh, savoring, enjoying something that's happening right now, uh, gratitude, acts of kindness, personal interactions, uh, prayer, meditation, exercise, and sleep. And so these are the actions that if you will practice them in your life, yes, they will lead to a higher level of happiness. And all these things, I've taken the time to preach on each one of those and always preaching them with the eyes of faith, looking at those things with spiritual eyes, being able to see how yes, yes, and yes again. The Bible does say yes. All those things she's talking about, the Bible would say yes, amen, you're right. Um, she, uh, in this, uh, her final admonition is to make goals. Uh, she had a guest appearance by Gabriella Otegen. Uh, she is the author of Rethinking Positive Thinking. Her strategy that she uses in the book is called WOOP, W-O-O-P. It stands for Wish, Outcome, Obstacle, and Plan. And so... Um, uh, we have um, been quarantined, uh, most of us, and I hope during this quarantine time, you did create some things you wanted to accomplish during that time in the house, with your family, uh, with your relationship, possibly some study type things, learning type things, and, and the ideas at the same time, even as I preach this, I hope you're beginning to think about what life is going to be like on the other side, some plans 
that you would make to accomplish some tasks in your life. And so, uh, very simply, whoop. She just, it just means to make a wish or a desire, something you'd like to see happen in your life, then recognizing how that would enhance your life, how that would be good for you, for other people you love. Uh, at the same time, recognizing the obstacles, the second O in there, uh, that there are some things that would be difficult, some things that make it tough to pull off. And then finally, you actually set up a plan. How can I accomplish this task? And so this is what she's uh, pushing her students towards doing. And uh, she's imparted us some knowledge. And uh, like I say, the rest of her class is trying to get her students to now put into practice. And, and in order to do that, they're going to need to make some plans. How am I going to make this happen? Where am I going to find this time to do this? And they're going to have to start planning some of these things out in my life. So her, my last sermons con connected to her last subject that she spoke on in her class, which was the idea of making plans and completing them. But I really want to concentrate on the joy or the happiness you get when you have a, something you want to accomplish. You take the work and the time to accomplish it, that there's a special supernatural joy that God wants you to have when you do that. It's necessary in the life you and I are living. So here's our text. I'm just going to read the first part from Proverbs 13, 19. A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. And uh, a desire, a wish, that's the W of W-O-O-P. And uh, let's let you know the Bible does differentiate between the wishes of the righteous and the wicked. And I trust as you're listening to me, you are not in the camp of the wicked because God treats the desires and wishes of the wicked very differently than he treats the wishes and desires of his people. And so, uh, but I want you to see something here about this, this idea of this desire, this wish and our relationship with Almighty God. The Hebrew word is tabaha. It is a desire and a delight. And uh, in Psalms 10, 17, God hears about our desire. He prepares our heart. Okay, he's heard this desire. He's gonna be involved in the very making of the plan that you might come together with. I want you to understand this. You and I do not do anything in this life without him working with us, okay? We are partners, we're covenant relationship. So here it is, he says, I, I, he, he hears the desire, he prepares our hearts, and he opens up our ears to hear from him. He's gonna help us with this desire. He might shave a few things, he might lift it up a little bit, and he's gonna help us with a plan. He's gonna point out some problems we're gonna to have to deal with. But once again, God is gonna be a part of this. But why? Why does, because he does not want us to become oppressors. I you to think that through for a second. Our desires, the things that God puts in our hearts are not designed to hurt other people. Um, Proverbs eleven twenty three. God says he sees our desires as only good. And I'm pointing this out because I want you to understand something. What you and I desire as a Christian is very different from what someone would desire who's in the world and looking for the world to fulfill those desires. In Proverbs 13, 12, he says, our accomplished desires become a tree of life. And the picture, once again, is you accomplishing the task, you making your dream come true, you pulling it off, you become an inspiration to other people. It's almost like when they talk to you, they can take a piece of that fruit off of your very life, taste that fruit, enjoy. There's something life-giving about who you are when you accomplish tasks, when you make dreams realities. And this is what you and I are called to do. This is part of our life. This is part of the way God designed us. He created us, hallelujah. How did he create us? In his image. Who is he? He is creative. He is the creator of all things, hallelujah. And he wants you and I to be creative in making things happen. Um, in this um, uh, picture here in Proverbs 19, 22, he says, our desire is our kindness. Now, stop for a second just to think about this. In our series, one of the things that leads to personal happiness are acts of kindness. And God says, our desire is our kindness. That something about the dreams that we have, the things we want to accomplish in our lives, there's usually some part of it, some facet of it, that's not all about me, 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 me. There's something about it that reaches out and touches other people in kindness. 
hallelujah, one of the very things that make us internally happier and happier. Um, having godly desires is a gift from heaven. All these things that uh, Professor Santos is trying to direct us to, they're all biblical. They're all godly goals found in the Bible. She is sure that pursuing those goals of savoring, gratitude, kindness, fellowship, sweet sleep, exercise and prayer will lead to a happier, happier living. And they are all biblical admonitions. And her last part here is making a plan to make these things part of your life. Finally, Psalms 37, for delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Amen. There is a beauty in walking with Jesus that cannot be found in this world. Hallelujah. Delight yourself in who you are in Christ. Amen. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Second part of the, our verse is accomplished. How does something come to pass? How does something go from a wish or desire to a concrete accomplishment? Uh, in our class, she's given us whoop uh, and uh, W-O-O-P. And it's, it's a strategy that all of us intuitively follow anytime we try to do anything. Uh, if we want to have a desire to remodel our kitchen, you know, we, we have this desire to remodel the kitchen. We see the outcome uh, of this nice organized kitchen where everything's where it's supposed to be. Everything looks clean. Everything's wonderful. It's not yet. And so we have this outcome. And then we recognize some obstacles, money, time, inconveniences. And so we recognize, and, and then we're mulling this all through our mind and we're making a decision. Am I going to pursue this dream? Are those obstacles too big? You know, what's the, and finally, if we say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to make this happen. We make a plan. We begin to marshal our forces and we make the, 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 the dream or the wish or the desire become a reality. Making a plan and then following through and completing that plan to accomplish something is the healthiest thing any human being can do. Uh, the idea of kids saying, I ain't got nothing to do, There's, I do, that's destructive to the soul. It's destroying people to do nothing with their lives. And so I just always recommend to anyone I ever come into contact with, one of the simplest things you can do to turn your life around right now is find something to do, do it with all your strength and make it happen. And this is just a godly, once again, it's a godly admonition. Um, one of my favorite Bible characters is a man named Haram, H-U-R-A-M, and he's the builder of the temple. And so he's being sent over by another king and Second Chronicles 2, 13 and 14 describe him. Now I have sent a skillful man endowed with power and understanding. Haram, my master craftsman, skilled to accomplish any plan which he may be given with your skillful men and with the skillful men of the Lord, David, your Father. Now there's a whole lot there, but it's the whole point I want you to see. He's able to take a plan, look at the plan, figure out what needs to be done, know what the obstacles are, and figure out a way to get the job done. This is why he's the master craftsman. This is why he's the man selected to do this job. He's going to start something, he's going to finish it. If there's obstacles, he's going to get over those obstacles. He's a man who can get the job done. You need to be a man, a woman, or a young person who gets the job done. Another favorite verse of mine is Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. The, the key word is excels. And um, this Hebrew word is the idea of water moving. And we all know how water moves. It'll find a way to go over any obstacle, around any obstacle, under any obstacle, or through any obstacle. The idea is that a person who excels, no matter what the obstacle, they find a way to accomplish the task. They find a way to finish the job. And this is the kind of person that you and I should strive to want to be, a person who excels in the things of life that we're involved in. And so this is a quality, once again, I believe needs to be instilled into every single young person. Try and try again. It used to be these things were all taught in our nursery schools, our nursery rhymes, not so much anymore, but try and try and try again. If you don't succeed uh, at first, try again. And so this used to be a common part of just, uh, of, of raising any child anywhere in the world. The idea of get up and try again. 
make this happen. And so Proverbs 21 5, 5 says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty. I just want to focus on that word, one word, diligent. The word diligent means the ditch already dug. When you ask a diligent person to do something, it's done the minute you ask. They're going to find a way to make sure the job gets done. They say they're going to do it. You can be assured they're going to do it. If they're going to be at a certain place at a certain time, they're going to be there at that certain time. And so this is a diligent, it's a quality. This is something you train yourself to be a diligent person. You train yourself to overcome obstacles. You train yourself to not get discouraged. At one point, David has to say he encouraged himself in the Lord. There's many times when we think we can't do this. We have to encourage ourselves in the Lord so that we can rise above the problems that are thrown before us. And so how do you instill this in a child? How do I instill this in a church? How do you instill this in your own life? You get a wish, a dream, a desire. You think about what you want to accomplish with it, what it's going to look like. You recognize the problems. You bat it around. You think it around. You talk. You might even want to write some things down, talk to some other people. And eventually you make a decision. I'm going to do this. And you make a plan. You start setting some things down. In your mind, at least, you have this, I need to do 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 this. And as you start to do these things, you recognize there might be this problem, that problem. And once again, God Almighty is helping you while this is happening. And he might change the dynamics of your plan. He might make it larger. He might make it smaller. But he's going to help you accomplish the task because he knows you, a desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. He knows that you getting the job done is going to be good for you. Amen. Um, and that leads us to the final point of the sermon. Why? And I just said it. Because a desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. You, okay, I, I, I prepared a sermon. I kind of watched this classroom thing go on. I thought about it. I reviewed everything today. I knew this was going to be my last time using that course as a, a background for the sermon. So I kind of spent some time going over the whole class, remembering some different things that were said. And then I sat down and I began to methodically put my sermon together. You know, finally, after finishing putting the sermon together, I stand here in front of my phone and I'm talking into my phone. And guess what? Uh, well, for me, they didn't quite end. I got this six hour process of uploading this thing, which drives me nuts. But nonetheless, when this entire process is finished, it is sweet to my soul. You need that. You need that in every area of your life. Amen. Um, Joan and I are here in New York. And I've said this already that Joan's mom got released from the hospital. I really couldn't do anything more for her. She was going to go into um, hospice care, but because of the virus, uh, she couldn't get into any kind of the homes or anything like that. And so Joan and I came here and were, you know, just taking care of her. So when she first showed up at the house, she she couldn't move. She's bed and just sitting in the bed. She couldn't even lift the, you know, the fork to, to feed herself. We're feeding her. And yet, here it is this morning. Not only is she hardly eating, she's cutting meat. That's what she, one of the things, because we, we told her, anything you want, we'll get for you. One of her desires was meat on the bone. And so she's having to saw a little bit of meat off that bone a couple times here. And she's eating hard. And this morning, she walked. She used a walker, but she walked from the bedroom to the kitchen. I want you to know something. A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. This is something that is irrelevant to this to what's going on in your life and I'm, I'm saying this I, I want to make this really clear uh, Professor Santos once again she marshals all of these studies you know gee you find out you have AIDS and was one of them and you think is that going to make you unhappy you know once again sure there's a little bump of unhappiness as you discover it but very quickly you just get back to your normal level of happiness the idea, the point that I'm trying to make is even if you lose the ability to walk, even if you go blind, even if the worst things that you can imagine happen to you, Joseph in prison, no matter what, all of these things, you can accomplish tasks that are sweet to the soul. Can you say amen? It is so important to realize this is not just for people that are super good at doing stuff. 
Anybody can learn how to do something and overcome in their life. Anyone can look at anything and get it together enough to accomplish that task if they want to. And this is the way God made us. Um, the last the last word in all of this is nefesh soul. And uh, you, you look there and there's many ways of expressing exactly what it means, but I'll, I'll say it one more time. It's the person you really are on the inside. Sweet to the soul. Every time I accomplish a task in my life, there's this sweetness God brings to who I am. How about you? Is it a bitter soul? Is it a condemned soul? Is it a guilty soul? That's not what we're looking for. In Christ, I want you to understand that in Christ, it should be a clean soul. A soul that can take in the good things that God has for us. And in that soul, hallelujah, the person you really are in the inside, you want strength, you want joy, and accomplishing a task, a desire accomplished is sweet, good for the soul. Hallelujah. As we do this, amen, our professor Santos, everything she's describing is good for your soul. It's good for those students' souls. Whether they know Christ or not, it's good for their souls. What is she asking? You know, and I'll, I'll say this. Take her advice. This is what she advises. Start savoring the good moments of the life you're living. Enjoy the life you're living. Take time to enjoy that moment. Whatever that moment is, you can enjoy that moment. Start a gratitude list. Start practicing acts of kindness. Start enjoying every encounter with someone else. Start exercising 30 days, 30 minutes a day, she says. Start sleeping seven hours a day. And then start praying every day. And then finally, as she ends this portion of her class, make some plans to accomplish these goals. Make some plans to accomplish the goals in your life Sweet to the soul, sweet to the soul. Yes, I want sweet to my soul. When Jesus was on the cross, he's dying. He says these words at one point, it is finished. John at that point says, spirit left him. People say, what did, what did Jesus come to earth for? Was he a great teacher as the best of teachers? to heal people, to do miracles. Yes, he did, every single one of them. But what did he come to earth for? He came to earth to die on the cross, to pay the price for our sin, to allow us to have our spirits reborn with the Spirit of God. You, you gotta catch what's going on here. That could only be accomplished if he paid the price for sin your sin, my sin. And he died because he was sinless. He died for our sins. It's finished. He took that last breath, all of the sins of all of mankind that he was carrying upon him at that moment, and he died for all those sins. He says, it is finished. I want you to know something. He finished the task. He finished the course. The thing that the Father had set down for him to do, he did. Come on, hallelujah. You and I, start something, finish it. Walk with Christ to the end. Thank you very much.